Chapter 89 He act like he well raised, and he seem like he handy, massa, said Uncle Mingo, concluding his description of the boy who lived up on Slave Row, but whose name he had neglected to ask. When Massa Leah immediately agreed to give him a tryout, Mingo was greatly pleased, since he had been wanting a helper for several years, but not really surprised. He was well aware that the Massa was concerned about his Gamecock trainer's advancing age and uncertain health. For the past five or six months, he had fallen prey to increasingly frequent spells of bad coughing. He also knew that the Massa's efforts to buy a promising young slave apprentice trainer had come to naught among the area's other Gamecock owners, who were quite naturally disinclined to help him out. If I had any boy showing any signs of ability, the Massa told him one had said, you got to have more sense than to think I'd sell him. With that old Mingo of yours training him five or ten years from now, I'd see him helping you beat me. But the likeliest reason for Massalia's quick approval, Mingo knew, was that Caswell County's annual cockfighting season would be opening shortly with the big New Year main fight. And if the boys simply fed the younger birds, Mingo would be able to spend that much more time conditioning and training the freshly matured two-year-olds that soon would be brought in from their open range walks. On the morning of George's first day on the job, Mingo showed him how to feed the scores of cockerels that were kept in several pens, each containing young birds of roughly the same ages and sizes. Seeing that the boy performed that trial task acceptably, the old man next let him feed the more matured stags, not quite a year old, but already trying to fight each other from their triangular pens within the zigs and zags of a split rail fence. Through the days that followed, Mingo kept George practically on the run, feeding the birds their cracked corn, giving them clean grit, oyster shell, and charcoal, and changing the sweet spring water in the drinking tins three times daily. George had never dreamed that he could feel awe for chickens, especially the stag, which were starting to grow spurs and to develop bright feather colors as they strutted fearlessly about with their lustrous eyes flashing defiance. If he was away from Uncle Mingo's immediate scrutiny, sometimes George would laugh aloud at how some of the stags would suddenly rear back their heads and crow awkwardly and throatily, as if they were trying to compete with the frequent raucous cries of Mingo's six- or seven-year-old roosters, each bearing the scars of many past battles that Uncle Mingo called catchcocks and always fed himself. George pictured himself as one of the stags and Uncle Mingo as one of the old roosters. At least once every day when Massa Leah came riding on his horse down the sandy road into the Gamecock training area, George would make himself as inconspicuous as possible, having quickly sensed how much chillier the Massa was acting toward him. George had heard Miss Malizzi saying that the Massa didn't even permit the missus to come down where his chickens were but she had indignantly assured him that was the last thing she'd want to do. The Massa and Mingo would go walking around inspecting the pens of game fowl, with Mingo always keeping exactly one step behind, close enough to hear and respond to whatever the Massa said between the crowings of the scarred old catchcock roosters. George noticed that the Massa spoke almost companionably with Uncle Mingo, in sharp contrast to his brusque and cold manner with Uncle Pompey, Sister Sarah, and his mammy, who were only field hands. Sometimes when their inspection tour brought them close enough to wherever George was working, he would then overhear what they were saying. I figure to fight 30 cocks this season, Mingo, so we've got to bring in around 60 or more from the range walk, said the Massa one day. Yes, Massa, by the time we culls them out, we ought to have a good 40 birds that'll train good. George's head became more and more filled with questions every day, but he had the feeling that it would be best not to ask Uncle Mingo anything he didn't have to. Mingo scored it as a point in the boy's favor that he could keep from talking too much, since wise gamecockers kept many secrets to themselves. <laughs>
Mingo's small, quick, deeply squinting eyes, meanwhile, missed no detail of how George performed his work. Deliberately, he gave his orders briefly and then quickly walked away to test how quickly and well the boy would grasp and remember instructions. Mingo was pleased that George seemed to need to be told most things only once. After a while, Mingo told Massalia that he approved of George's care and attention to the game fowl, but he carefully qualified himself. Leastways far as I've been able to tell in just this little bit of time, Massa. Mingo was totally unprepared for Massalia's reply. I've been thinking you need that boy down here all the time. Your cabin's not big enough, so you and him put up a shack somewhere so he'll be handy to you all the time. Mingo was appalled at the prospect of anyone's sudden and total invasion of the privacy that only he and the gamefowl had shared for over twenty years, but he wasn't about to voice openly any disagreement. After the massa had left, he spoke to George in a sour tone. Massa say I needs you down here all the time. I reckon he must know something I don't. Yassa, said George, struggling to keep his expression blank. But where are I going to stay at, Uncle Mingo? We got to build you a shack. As much as he enjoyed the Gamecocks and Uncle Mingo, George knew this would mean the end of his enjoyable times in the big house, waving the peacock plumes and preaching for the massa and the misses and their guests. Even Mrs. Leah had just begun to show that she'd taken a liking to him, and he thought of the good things he wouldn't get to eat from Miss Melizzi in the kitchen anymore. But the worst part about leaving Slave Row was going to be breaking the news to his mammy, Kizzy was soaking her tired feet in a wash pan full of hot water when George came in, his face unusually somber. Mammy, something I gotta tell you. Well, tired as I is, chopping all day long, I don't want to hear no more about them chickens tell you that. Well, ain't exactly that. He took a deep breath. Mammy, Massa done told me and Uncle Mingo to build a shack and move me down there. Kizzy sent some of the water splattering out of the pan as she leaped up, seemingly ready to spring on George. Move you for what? What you can't do staying up here where you always been? Weren't my doing, Mammy, it was Massa. He stepped back from the fury on her face, voice rising to a high-pitched cry. I ain't wanting to leave you, Mammy. You ain't old enough to be moving nowhere. I bet it's that old Mingo... Put Massa up to it. No, he didn't, Mammy, cause I can tell he don't like it neither. He don't like nobody around him all the time. He then told me he'd rather be by himself. George wished he could think of something to say that would calm her down. Massa feel like he being good to me, Mammy. He treat Uncle Mingo and me nice. Ain't like he acts to feel hands. Too late, he gulped sickly, remembering that his Mammy was a field hand. Jealousy and bitterness twisted her face as she grabbed George and shook him like a rag, screaming, Massa don't care nothing about you. He may be yo pappy, but he don't care nothing about nobody but them chickens. She was almost as stunned as he was by what she had said. It's true, and just well you know it for you's figuring he doing you sich favors. Only thing Massa wants is you's helping that old crazy take care of his chickens that he figure gonna make him rich. George stood dumbfounded. She went pummeling at George with both fists. Well, what you hanging on round here for? Whirling, she snatched up his few items of clothing and flung them toward him. Go on, get out in this cabin. George stood there as if he had been poleaxed, feeling her tears flooding up and spilling out. Kizzy ran from the cabin and went bolting across to Miss Melizzi's. George's own tears trickled down his face. After a while, unsure what else to do, he stuffed his few pieces of clothing into a sack and went stumbling back down the road to the gamecock area. He slept near one of the stag pens, using his sack for his pillow. In the pre-dawn, the early rising Mingo came upon him asleep there and guessed what had happened. Throughout the day, he went out of his way to be gentle with the boy, who went about his tasks silent and withdrawn. During their two days of building the tiny shack, Mingo began speaking to him as if he had only just now really become aware of George's presence. Your life got to be these chickens, till they's like your family, boy, he said abruptly one morning.
that being the foremost thing that he wanted to plant in his mind. But George made no response. He couldn't think of anything but what his mother had told him. His massa was his pappy. His pappy was his massa. He couldn't deal with it either way. When the boy still said nothing, Mingo spoke again. I knows dem <laughs> up yonder thinks I's peculiar, he hesitated. I reckon I is. Now he fell silent. George realized that Uncle Mingo expected him to respond, but he couldn't admit that that was exactly what he had heard about the old man. So he asked a question that had been on his mind since the first day he came to visit. Uncle Mingo, how come these chickens ain't like the rest? You's talking about tame chickens ain't fit for nothing except eatin', said Uncle Mingo scornfully. These here birds near about the same as they was back in dem jungles, Massa say they come from in ancient times. Fact, I believes you stick one of these cocks in the jungle, he just fight to take over the hens and kill any other roosters just like he ain't never left. George had other questions he'd been saving up to ask, but he hardly got the chance to open his mouth once Uncle Mingo got going. Any game cockerel that crowded before reaching the stag stage, he said, should promptly have its neck wrung, for crowing too early was a sure signal of cowardice later on. The true birds come out in the egg with the fightin' already in day blood from day granddaddies and great granddaddies. Massa say way back, a man and his game chickens was like a man and his dogs is now, but these birds got mo fightin' in them than you find in dogs, or bulls, or bears, or coons, or whole lots of men's. Massa say it's all the way up to kings and presidents fights game birds, cause it's the greatest sport they is. Uncle Mingo noticed George staring at the latticework of small, livid scars on his black hands, wrists, and forearms. Going over to his cabin, Mingo returned shortly with a pair of curving steel spurs that tapered to needle sharpness. The day you starts to handle in birds, your hands gonna be looking like mine. Lesson you's mighty careful, said Uncle Mingo, and George was thrilled that the old man seemed to consider it possible that he might put spurs on the masses' game fowl one day. Through the following weeks, though, long intervals would pass when Uncle Mingo wouldn't permit much conversation, for it had been years since he had talked with anyone except for the massa and the game chickens. But the more he began to get used to having George around and thinking of the boy as his assistant, the oftener he would break his silence to address him, almost always abruptly, about something he felt would help George to understand that only the most superbly bred, conditioned, and trained game fowl could consistently win fights and money for Massalia. Massa don't fear no man in the cockpit, Uncle Mingo told him one night. Fact, he loved to match up against them real rich masses that can ford them flock so much as a thousand birds so they can pick out maybe they best hundred to fight with every year. You see, we ain't got no great big flock, but Massa still win plenty betting against them rich ones. They don't like it cause he done come up in the world from starting out as a pole cracker. But with enough real fine birds and enough luck, Massa could get to be just big and rich as they is. Uncle Mingo squinted at George. You hear me, boy? Whole lots of peoples ain't realize how much money can be wind in cockfighting. I knows one thing. If somebody was to offer me a hundred acre cotton or tobacco field or a real good fightin' cock, I take the bird every time. That's how Massa feel, too. That's how come he ain't put his money in no whole big lot of land or owning no big passalo. By the time George turned 14, he began his Sundays off by visiting with his Slave Row family, which he felt included Miss Malizzi, Sister Sarah, and Uncle Pompey, no less than his own mammy. Even after all this time, he would have to reassure her that he harbored no ill will over the way she told him about his father, but he still thought a lot about his pappy, though he never discussed it with anyone, least of all the massa. Everyone on Slave Row by now was openly awed by his new status, though they tried to seem as if they weren't. I diapered yo messy behind, and you just let me catch you putting on any airs, I still beat it in a minute, exclaimed Sister Sarah with affectionate mock ferocity one Sunday morning. George grinned. No, Sister Sarah, ain't got no airs. 
but they were all consumed with curiosity about the mysterious things that took place down in the forbidden area where he lived with the Gamecocks. George told them only things of a routine nature. He said he had seen Gamecocks kill a rat, drive off a cat, even attack a fox, but the game hens could be as bad-tempered as the roosters, he told them, and sometimes even crowed like the roosters. He said that the Massa was vigilant against trespassers because of the high prices one could get for even the stolen eggs of championship birds, not to mention for the birds themselves, which thieves could easily take into another state and sell, or even fight as their own. When George said that Uncle Mingo had spoken of as much as $3,000 having been paid for one bird by the very rich game-cocking Massa Jewett, Miss Malizzi exclaimed, Laud could have bought three, four <laughs> for lesson that chicken. After he had talked with them at length, George would begin to grow restless and fidgety by early Sunday afternoon, and soon he would go hurrying back down the sandy road to his chickens. Slowing down as he passed their pens along the road, he would pluck fresh tender green grass, drop a handful into each one, and sometimes stand a while enjoying the stag's contented gluck, gluck, gluck as they gobbled it down. About a year old now, they were maturing into glossy full feather, with fire in their eyes, and entering a stage of sudden explosive crowing and vicious flurrying efforts to get at each other. The quicker the better we get some out of the range walks to start matin, Uncle Mingo had said not long ago. George knew what would happen when the fully matured roosters already out on the range walks would be brought in to be conditioned and trained for the coming cockfighting season. After visiting with the stags, George would usually spend the rest of the afternoon off wandering farther down the road into the pine groves where the range walks were. Occasionally, he caught a glimpse of one of the fully grown birds there ruling a covey of hens in total liberty. Grass, seeds, grasshoppers, and other insects, he knew, were plentiful there, along with good gravel for their craws and as much sweet, fresh water as they wanted from the grove's several natural springs. One chilly morning in early November, when Massa Leah arrived in the mule cart, Uncle Mingo and George were waiting with the crowing, viciously pecking stags already collected in covered wicker baskets. After loading them into the cart, George helped Uncle Mingo catch his favorite old scarred, squawking catchcock. He's just like you, Mingo, said Massa Leah with a laugh, done all his fightin' and breedin' in his young days, fit for nothin' but to eat and crow now. Grinning, Uncle Mingo said, I ain't hardly even crowin' no mo' now, Massa. Since George was as much in awe of Uncle Mingo as he was afraid of the Massa, he was happy to see them both in such rare good spirits. Then the three of them climbed onto the mule cart, Uncle Mingo seated alongside the massa holding his old catchcock, and George balancing himself in the back behind the baskets. Finally, Massa Leah stopped the cart deep in the pine grove. He and Uncle Mingo cocked their heads, listening carefully. Then Mingo spoke softly. I hears him back in there. Abruptly puffing his cheeks, he blew hard on the head of the old catchcock, which promptly crowed vigorously. Within seconds came a loud crowing from among the trees, and again the old catchcock rooster crowed, its hackles rising. Then goose pimples broke out over George when he saw the magnificent gamecock that came bursting from the edge of the grove. Iridescent feathers were bristled high over the solid body. The glossy tail feathers were arched. A covey of about nine hens came hurrying up nervously, scratching and clucking, as the range rock cock powerfully beat its wings and gave a shattering crow, jerking its head about, looking for the intruder. Massalia spoke in a low tone, let him see the catchcock, Mingo. Uncle Mingo hoisted it high, and the range rock cock seemed almost to explode into the air straight after the old rooster. Massalia moved swiftly, grabbing the thrashing range walk cock in flight, deftly avoiding the wickedly long natural spurs that George glimpsed as the massa thrust it into a basket and closed the top. "'What you gawkin' for, boy? Loose one dem stags,' barked Uncle Mingo, as if George had done it before. 
he fumbled open the nearest basket, and the released stag flapped out beyond the mule cart and to the ground. After no more than a moment's hesitation, it flapped its wings, crowed loudly, dropped one wing, and went strutting stiffly around one hen. Then the new cock of the walk started chasing all the other hens back into the pine grove. Twenty-eight mature two-year-olds had been replaced with year-old stags when the mule cart returned just before dusk. After doing it all over again to get thirty-two more the next day, George felt he had been retrieving game cocks from range walks all his life. He now busily fed and watered the sixty cocks. When they weren't eating, it seemed to him, they were crowing and pecking angrily at the sides of their pens, constructed so as to prevent their seeing each other, which would have caused some of them to get injured in their violent efforts to fight. With wonder, George beheld these majestically wild, vicious, and beautiful birds. They embodied everything that Uncle Mingo ever had told him about their ancient bloodlines of courage about how both their physical design and their instincts made them ready to fight any other gamecock to the death any time, anywhere. The Massa believed in training twice as many birds as he planned to fight during the season. Some birds just don't never pick up and feed and work like the rest, Uncle Mingo explained to George, and them what don't, we's gonna cull out. Massa Leah began to arrive earlier than before to work along with Uncle Mingo studying the sixty birds, one by one, for several hours each day. Overhearing snatches of their conversations, George gathered that they would be culling out birds with any sores on their heads or bodies, or with what they judged to be less than perfect beaks, necks, wings, legs, or overall configuration. But the worst sin of all was not showing enough aggressiveness. One morning the Massa arrived with a carton from the big house. George watched as Uncle Mingo measured out quantities of wheat meal and oatmeal and mixed them into a paste with butter, a bottle of beer, the whites of twelve game hen eggs, some wood sorrel, ground ivy, and a little licorice. The resulting dough was patted into thin, round cakes, which were baked to crispness in a small earth oven. This bread give em strength, said Uncle Mingo, instructing George to break the cakes into small bits feed each bird three handfuls daily, and put a little sand in their water pans each time he refilled them. I want them exercised down to nothing but muscle and bone, Mingo. I don't want one ounce of fat in that cockpit. George heard the Massa order. Gonna run day tails off, Massa. Starting the next day, George was sprinting back and forth, tightly holding under an arm one of Uncle Mingo's old catchcocks, as it was hotly pursued by one after another of the cocks in training. As Mingo had instructed, George would occasionally let the pursuing cock get close enough to spring up with its beak snapping and legs scissoring at the furiously squawking catchcock. Catching the panting aggressor, Uncle Mingo would quickly let it hungrily peck up a walnut-sized ball of unsalted butter mixed with beaten herbs. Then he would put the tired bird on some soft straw within a deep basket, piling more straw over the bird, up to the top, then closing the lid. It gonna sweat good down in there now, he explained. After exercising the last of the cocks, George began removing the sweating birds from their baskets. Before he returned them to their pens, Uncle Mingo licked each bird's head and eyes with his tongue, explaining to George, "'Dat get em used to it, if I has to suck blood clots out in day beaks to help em keep breathing when they done got bad hurt fighting.'" By the end of a week, so many sharp, natural cockspurs had nicked George's hands and forearms that Uncle Mingo grunted, "'You gonna get mistook for a game cocker, you don't watch out.'" Except for George's brief Christmas morning visit to Slave Row, the holiday season passed for him almost unnoticed. Now, as the opening of the cockfighting season approached, the birds' killer instincts were at such a fever pitch that they crowed and pecked furiously at anything, beating their wings with a loud, whomping noise. George found himself thinking how often he heard his mammy, Miss Melizzi, Sister Sarah, and Uncle Pompey bemoaning their lot. Little did they dream what an exciting life existed, just a short walk down the road.
Two days after the new year, George grasped each gamecock in turn as Massalia and Uncle Mingo closely snipped each bird's head feathers, shortened the neck, wing, and rump feathers, then shaped the tail feathers into short, curving fans. George found it hard to believe how much the trimming accentuated the bird's slim, compact bodies, snake-like necks, and big, strong-beaked heads with their shining eyes. Some of the bird's lower beaks had to be trimmed too, for one day has to grab a mouth hold, explained Uncle Mingo. Finally, their natural spurs were scraped smooth and clean. At the first light of opening day, Mingo and George were stowing the finally selected twelve birds in square traveling coops woven of hickory strips. Uncle Mingo fed each bird a walnut-sized lump of butter mixed with powdered brown sugar candy. Then Massa Leah arrived in the wagon, carrying a peck of red apples. After George and Mingo loaded the twelve cock coops, Mingo climbed up on the seat beside the Massa, and the wagon began rolling. Glancing back, Uncle Mingo rasped, You going or not? Leaping after them, George reached the wagon's tailgate and vaulted up and in. No one had said he was going. After catching his breath, he hunkered down into a squatting position. The wagon's squeakings mingled in his ears with the gamecock's crowings, cluckings, and peckings. He felt deep gratitude and respect for Uncle Mingo and Massalia, and he thought again, always with perplexity and surprise, about his mammy's having said that the Massa was his daddy, or his daddy was the Massa, whichever it was. Farther along the road, George began seeing either ahead or emerging from side roads other wagons, carts, carriages, and buggies, as well as horsemen and poor crackers on foot carrying bulging crocus sacks that George knew contained gamecocks bedded in straw. He wondered if Massalia had once walked to cockfights like that with his bird, which people said he had won with a raffle ticket. George saw that most of the vehicles carried one or more white men and slaves, and every vehicle carried some cockpens. He remembered Uncle Mingo's saying, cockfighting folks don't care nothing about time or distance when a big main gonna happen. George wondered if maybe some of those poor crackers afoot would someday come to own a farm and a big house like the Massa did. After about two hours, George began hearing what could only be the crowing of many gamecocks faintly in the distance. The incredible chorus grew steadily louder as the wagon drew nearer to a heavy thicket of tall forest pines. He smelled the aroma of barbecuing meat. Then the wagon was among others maneuvering for places to park. All around, horses and mules were tied to hitching posts, snorting, stomping, swishing their tails, and many men were talking. Tom Leah! The Massa had just stood up in the wagon, flexing his knees to relieve the stiffness. George saw that the cry had come from several poor crackers standing nearby exchanging a bottle among themselves, and was thrilled at the instant recognition of his Massa. Waving at those men, Massalia jumped to the ground and soon had joined the crowd. Hundreds of white people, from small boys holding their father's pants legs to old, wrinkled men, were all milling about in conversational clusters. Glancing around, George saw that nearly all the slave people remained in vehicles, seemingly attending to their cooped gamecocks, and the hundreds of birds sounded as if they were staging a crowing contest. George saw bed rolls under various nearby wagons and guessed that the owners had come from such long distances that they were going to have to stay overnight. He could smell the pungent aroma of corn liquor. Quit setting there gaping, boy. We gotta limber up these birds, said Uncle Mingo, who had just gotten the wagon parked. Blocking out the unbelievable excitement as best he could, George began opening the travel coops and handing one after another angrily pecking bird into Uncle Mingo's gnarled black hands, which proceeded to massage each bird's legs and wings. Receiving the final bird, Uncle Mingo said, Chop up half dozen dem apples, good and fine. Days de best last eaten for these birds gets to fightin'. Then the old man's glance happened to catch the boy's glazed stare at the crowd, and Uncle Mingo remembered how it had been for him at his first cockfight, longer ago than he cared to think about anymore. Go on, he barked. 
get out in there and run around a little bit if you want to, but be back for day starts, you hear me? By the time his yasa reached Uncle Mingo, George had vaulted over the wagon's side and was gone. Slithering among the jostling, drinking crowd, he darted this way and that, the carpeting of pine needles springy under his bare feet. He passed dozens of cock coops containing crowing birds in an incredible array of plumage from snow white to coal black, with every imaginable combination of colors in between. George stopped short when he saw it. It was a large sunken circle, about two feet deep, with padded sides, and its packed sandy clay floor was marked with a small circle in its exact center and two straight lines equally distant from each side. The cockpit. Looking up, he saw boisterous men finding seats on a natural sloping rise behind it, a lot of them exchanging bottles. Then he all but jumped from his skin at the nearby bellow of a reddish-faced official, "'Gentlemen, let's get started fighting these birds!' George sped back like a hare, reaching the wagon only an instant before Massalia did. Then the Massa and Uncle Mingo went walking around the wagon, talking in low tones as they glanced at the cooped birds. Standing up on the wagon's front seat, George could see over men's heads to the cockpit. Four men were there talking closely together, as two others came toward them, each cradling a gamecock under an arm. Suddenly, cries rose among the spectators. Ten on the red, taken, twenty on the blue, five of it, five more, covered. The cries grew louder and more numerous as George saw the two birds being weighed and then fitted by their owners with what George knew must be the needle-sharp steel gaffs. His memory flashed to Uncle Mingo once telling him that birds were seldom fought if either of them was more than two ounces lighter or heavier than the other. "'Bill your cocks!' cried someone at the edge of the cockpit. Then quickly he and two other men squatted outside the ring as the two owners squatted within the circle, holding their birds closely enough to let them peck briefly at each other. "'Get ready!' Backing to their opposite starting marks, the two owners held their birds onto the ground, straining to get at each other. Pit your cocks! With blurring speed, the gamecocks lunged against each other so hard that each of them went bouncing backward, but recovering within a second, they were up into the air shuffling their steel-gaffed legs. Dropping back onto the pit floor, instantly they were airborne again, a flurry of feathers. The red's cut, someone hollered, and George watched breathlessly as each owner snatched his bird as it came down, examining the bird quickly, then set it back on its start mark. The cut, desperate red bird somehow sprang higher than its opponent, and suddenly one of its scissoring legs had driven a steel gaff into the brain of the blue bird. It fell with its wings fluttering convulsively in death. Amid a welter of excited shouting and coarse cursing, George heard the referee's loud announcement. The winner is Mr. Grayson's bird, a minute and ten seconds in the second pitting. George's breath came in gasps. He saw the next fight end even more quickly, one owner angrily flinging aside his losing bird's bloody body as if it were a rag. Dead bird, just a mess of feathers, said Uncle Mingo close behind George. The sixth or the seventh fight had ended when an official cried out, Mr. Leah! The Massa walked hurriedly away from the wagon cradling a bird under his arm. George remembered feeding that bird, exercising it, holding it in his arms. He felt dizzy with pride. Then the Massa and his opponent were by the cockpit, weighing in their birds, then fitting on the steel gaffs amid a clamor of bedding cries. At Pit Your Cocks, the two birds smashed head-on. Taking to the air, they dropped back to the floor, furiously pecking, fainting, their snake-like necks maneuvering, seeking any opening. Again bursting upward, they beat at each other with their wings. And then they fell with Massalia's bird reeling, obviously gaffed. But within seconds, in the next aerial flurry, the Massa's bird fatally sank his own gaff. Massalia snatched up his bird, which was still crowing in triumph, and came running back to the wagon.
Only vaguely, George heard, the winner is Mr. Leah's, as Uncle Mingo seized the bleeding bird, his fingers flying over its body to locate the deep slash wound in the rib cage. Clamping his lips over it, Uncle Mingo's cheeks puckered inward with his force of sucking out the clotted blood. Suddenly thrusting the bird down before George's knees, Mingo barked, Piss on it, right there! The thunderstruck George gaped. Piss! Keep it from fecting. Fumbling, George did so. His strong stream splattered against the wounded bird and Uncle Mingo's hands. Then Uncle Mingo was packing the bird lightly between soft straw in a deep basket. Believe we save him, Massa. What one you fightin' next? Massa Leah gestured toward a coop. Get that bird out, boy. George nearly fell over himself complying, and Massa Leah went hurrying back toward the shouting crowd as another fight's winner was announced. Faintly, beneath the raucous crowing of hundreds of cocks crowing, of men shouting new bets, George could hear the injured bird clucking weakly in his basket. He was sad, exultant, frightened. He had never been so excited. And on that crisp morning, a new game cocker had been born. Chapter 90 Look at him trying to outstrut them roosters, exclaimed Kizzy to Miss Melizzy, Sister Sarah, and Uncle Pompey. George came striding up the road to spend his Sunday morning with them. Hmm. Sister Sarah snorted with a glance at Kizzy. Aw, oh, hush up, woman. We's just proud of him as you is. As George came on, still well beyond earshot, Miss Melizzy told the others that only the previous evening he had overheard Massalia declare tipsily to some gamecocker dinner guests that he had a boy who, after four years of apprenticeship, seemed as natural born to become, in time, the equal of any white or black gamecock trainer in Caswell County. Massa say old Mingo, <laughs> say that boy just live and breathe chickens. According to Massa, Mingo swear one evening late he was walking round down there and seed George sitting hunched over kind of funny on a stump. Mingo say he ease up behind real slow and he be dog if and George wasn't talking to some hens setting on day eggs. He swear that boy was telling him hens all about fights going to be wind by day baby chicks the hens bout to hatch. Do lot, said Kizzy, her eyes bathing in the sight of her approaching son. After the usual kissing and hugging with the women and handshaking with Uncle Pompey, they all settled onto stools brought quickly from their cabins. First, they told George the latest white folks' news that Miss Melizzy had managed to overhear during the week. The scant news this time was that more and more strange-talking white folks from across the big water were said to be arriving by the shiploads up north swelling the numbers of those already fighting to take the jobs previously held by free blacks. And there was also steadily increasing talk of sending the free blacks on ships to Africa. Living as he did in such isolation with that strange old man, they kidded George. He couldn't be expected to know about any of this, or about anything else that was going on in the rest of the world, lessen it get told to you by some of them chickens. And George laughingly agreed. These weekly visits offered not only the pleasure of seeing his mammy and the others, but also of getting some relief from Uncle Mingo's cooking, which was more suitable for chickens than for people. Miss Melizzy and Kizzy knew enough by now to prepare at least two or three platefuls of George's favorite dishes. When his conversation began to lag, around noon, as usual, they knew he was getting restless to leave, and after they had exacted his promise to pray regularly, and after another round of huggings and kissings and pumping of hands, George went hurrying back down the road with his basket of food to share with Uncle Mingo. In the summertime, George often spent the rest of his Sunday afternoon off in a grassy pasture where Mingo could see him springing about catching grasshoppers, which he would then feed as tidbits to the penned-up cockerels and stags. But this was early winter, and the two-year-old birds had just been retrieved from the range walks for training, and George was trying to salvage one of the several birds that Mingo and the Massa felt were probably too wild and man-shy to respond properly to training, and were likely to be called out as discards. 
Mingo watched with affection and amusement as George forcibly restrained the pecking, squawking, struggling stag and started crooning to it, blowing gently on its head and neck, rubbing his face against the brilliant feathers, massaging its body, legs, and wings, until it actually began to settle down. Mingo wished him luck, but he hoped George remembered what he had told him about taking chances with an unreliable bird. A gamecocker's breeding and development of a fine game flock could represent a lifetime investment, and it could all be lost in a single emotional gamble. You simply couldn't risk fighting a bird unless every detectable flaw had been permanently corrected, and if it wasn't well, George had learned by now to quite calmly wring a gamecock's neck. He had come to share fully the masses in Uncle Mingo's view that the only worthwhile birds were those whose intense training and conditioning, coupled with instinctive aggressiveness and courage, would drive them to drop dead in a cockpit before they would quit fighting. George loved it when the masses' birds killed their opponents swiftly and without injury, sometimes within as little as 30 or 40 seconds, but privately, though he never would have breathed this to Mingo or Massalia, nothing could match the thrill of watching a bird he had helped raise from a baby chick battle to the death with another equally game champion, each of them staggering, torn and bleeding, beaks lolling open, tongues hanging out, wings dragging on the cockpit floor, bodies and legs trembling, until finally both simply collapsed. Then, with the referee counting toward ten, the masses bird would find somehow one more ounce of strength to struggle up and drive in a fatal spur. George understood very well Mingo's deep attachment to the five or six scarred old catchcocks that he treated almost as pets, especially the one he said had won the biggest bet of the masses' career. Terriblest fight I ever seed, said Uncle Mingo, nodding toward that one-eyed veteran. It was back there in his prime, reckoned three, four years full you come here. Somehow or another, Massa had got in this great big New Year's main bean, backed by some real rich Massa clear over in Surrey County, Virginia. They announced no less than two hundred cocks was to fight for a ten thousand dollars main stake, with no less than hundred dollar side bets. Well, Massa and me took twenty birds. You let me tell you, them twenty birds was ready. We drive days in the wagon to get there, feedin' waterin' and massagin' them birds in day coops as we went. Well, gettin' on near the end of the fightin', we'd win some, but we'd all but we'd lost too many to get at that main purse, and Massa was plenty mad. Then he found out we was going to be matched against what folks claiming was the meanest mess of feathers in Virginia. You ought to hear the hollering of bets on that bird. Well now, Massa done hit his bottle a couple good licks and got all red in the face as he could get. And out in the birds we had left, he picked that old buzzard you was looking at right over there. Massa stuck that bird under one arm and commenced walking round that cockpit swearing loud he weren't backing off nobody's bets. He say he started with nothing. If he wind up with nothing again, he sure wouldn't be no stranger to it. Boy, let me tell you, that tough old meat and pin feathers over yonder went in that cockpit and he come out just barely, but that other bird was dead. Them referees announced they'd been steady trying to kill one another for nigh fourteen minutes. Uncle Mingo looked with warm nostalgia across at the old rooster. So bad cut up and bleeding he was supposed to die, but I ain't slept a wink till I saved him. Uncle Mingo turned toward George. Fact, boy, this something I's got to press on you, mo and I's done. You gotta do everything you can to save hurt birds. Even them that's been lucky enough to kill quick and standing up there crowing big and acting ready to fight again, well, they can fool you. Soon's you get him back in your wagon, be show sure you checks him good all over, real close. Maybe he got just some little spur cuts or nicks that can easily get affected. Any sitch cut, piss on it good. If it's any bleeding, put on a spider web compress or a little bit of the soft belly fur of a rabbit. If you don't, two, three days later, your bird can start looking like it's shrinking up, like a limp rag. Then next thing you know, your bird dead. 
Game birds is like I hears race hosses is. They's tough, but at the same time they's mighty delicate critters. It seemed to George that Uncle Mingo must have taught him a thousand things, yet thousands more were still in Uncle Mingo's head. As hard as George had tried to understand, he still couldn't comprehend how Mingo and the Massa could seem to sense which birds would prove to be the smartest, boldest, and proudest in the cockpit. It wasn't simply the assets you could see, which by now even George had learned to recognize. The ideal short, broad backs with the full, rounded chests tapering to a fine, straight keel bone and a small, compact belly. He knew that good, solid, round-boned wings should have hard-quilled, wide, glossy feathers that tended to meet under a median-angled tail, that short, thick, muscular legs should be spaced well apart, with stout spurs evenly spaced above strong feet whose long back toe should spread well backward and flat to the ground. Uncle Mingo would chide George for becoming so fond of some birds that he seemed to forget their jungle instincts. Now or then, some gamecock, docilely being petted in George's lap, would glimpse one of Uncle Mingo's old catchcocks, and with a shattering crow burst from George's grasp in violent pursuit of the old bird, with George racing up to stop them before one killed the other. Uncle Mingo also repeatedly cautioned George to control his emotions better when some bird of George's got killed in the cockpit. On several occasions, the big, strapping George had burst into tears. Nobody can't expect to win every fight. Don't know how many times I gotta tell you that, said Mingo. Mingo also decided to let the boy know that for several months he had been aware that George had been disappearing not long after full darkness fell, then returning very late recently close to daybreak. Uncle Mingo was sure it had a connection with George's having once mentioned, with elaborate casualness, that while he had been at the grist mill with Massalia one day, he had met a pretty and nearly high-yaller big house maid named Charity from the adjacent plantation. All these years down here, these of ears and eyes o' minds like a cat's. I know the first night you slipped off, Uncle Mingo said to his astounded apprentice. Now I ain't one to poke in nobody's business, but I was going to tell you something. You just be mighty show you ain't cotched by some these po' white patrollers. Because if they don't beat you half to death, they self, they'll bring you back. And don't you think Massa won't lay his whip across your ass? Uncle Mingo stared for a while across the grassy pasture before he spoke again. You notice I ain't said quit slipping off. Yes, sir, said George humbly. During another silence, Mingo sat down on a favorite stump of his, leaned slightly forward and crossed his legs, with his hands clasped around his knees. Boy, I remembers back when I first found out what gals was too, and a new light crept into Uncle Mingo's eyes as the aged features softened. It was this here long, tall gal, she was still new to the country when her massa bought a place right next to my massa's. Uncle Mingo paused, smiling. Best I can scribe her, well, the <laughs> Older and me commenced to call in her Black Snake. Uncle Mingo went on, his smile growing wider and wider the more he remembered, and he remembered plenty. But George was too chagrined at being caught to be embarrassed by anything Mingo was telling him. It was pretty clear, though, that he had underestimated the old man in more ways than one. Chapter 91 Walking up the road towards Slave Row one Sunday morning, George sensed that something was wrong when he saw that neither his mammy nor any of the others were standing around Kizzy's cabin to greet him, as they had never failed to do before in the four years he'd spent with Uncle Mingo. Quickening his pace, he reached his mammy's cabin and was about to knock when the door was snatched open and Kizzy practically jerked him inside, quickly shutting the door behind them, her face taut with fear. Is Mrs. Seed you? Ain't Seed her, mammy. What's the matter? Laud boy, Massa got word some free... <coughs> Over in Charleston, South Kalini, name o' Denmark Vesey, had hunted o ready to kill no telling how many white folks right tonight. If they hadn't a got caught, 
Mass ain't gone left here acting like he gone wild, a waving his shotgun and threatening to kill anybody miss he see outside de cabins fo he get back from some big organizing meeting. Kizzy slid alongside the cabin's wall until she could look through the cabin's single window toward the big house. She ain't still where she was peeping from. Maybe she seen you coming and went and hid. The absurdity of Mrs. Leah hiding from him struck some of Kizzy's alarm into George. Run back down with them chickens, boy. No telling what Mass would do. He catch you up here. I gonna stay here and talk to Massa, Mammy. He was thinking that in such an extremity as this, he would even somehow indirectly remind the Massa whose father he was, which should curb his anger, at least somewhat. You plum crazy? Get out of here! Kizzy was shoving George toward the cabin door. Go on, get! Mad as he was, he catch you here, just make it wuss on us. Slip through them bushes behind the toilet till you's out in sight, oh missy. Kizzy seemed on the verge of hysteria. The massa must have been worse than he'd ever been before to terrify her so. All right, mammy, he said finally, but I ain't slipping through no bushes. I ain't done nothing to nobody. I was going back down the road just same as I come up it. All right, all right, just go ahead. Returning to the game foul area, George had barely finished telling Uncle Mingo what he had heard, fearing that he sounded foolish when they heard a horse galloping up. Within moments, Massalia sat glowering down at them from his saddle, the reins in one hand, his shotgun in the other, and he directed the cold fury of his words at George. My wife saw you, so y'all know what happened. Yasa gulped George, staring at the shotgun. Then, starting to dismount, Massalia changed his mind, and staying on his horse, his face mottled with his anger, he told them, Plenty good white people would be dying tonight if one hadn't told his massa just in time. Proves you never can trust none of you. Massa Leah gestured with the shotgun. Ain't no telling what's in y'all's heads off down here by yourselves. But you just let me half think anything funny. I'll blow your heads off quick as a rabbit's. Glaring balefully at Uncle Mingo and George, Massalia wheeled his horse and galloped back up the road. A few minutes passed before Uncle Mingo even moved. Then he spat viciously and kicked away the hickory strips he had been weaving into a gamecock's carrying basket. Work a thousand years for a white man. You still any. He exclaimed bitterly. George didn't know what to say. Opening his mouth to speak again, then closing it, Mingo went toward his cabin, but turning at the door, he looked back at George. Hear me, boy. You think you something special with Massa, but nothing don't make no difference to mad, scared white folks. Don't you be no fool and slip off nowhere till this blow over, you hear me? I mean, don't. Yes, sir. George picked up the basket Mingo had been working on and sat down on a nearby stump. His fingers began to weave the hickory strips together as he tried to collect his thoughts. Once again, Uncle Mingo had managed to divine exactly what was going on inside his head. George grew angry for permitting himself to believe that Massalia would ever act like anything but a massa toward him. He should have known better by now how anguishing and fruitless it was to even think about the massa as his pappy, but he wished desperately that he knew someone he felt he could talk with about it. Not Uncle Mingo, for that would involve admitting to Uncle Mingo that he knew the Massa was his pappy. For the same reason, he could never talk to Miss Malizzi, Sister Sarah, or Uncle Pompey. He wasn't sure if they knew about the Massa and his mammy, but if one did, then they all would, because whatever anyone knew got told, even when it was about each other, behind each other's backs, and he and Kizzy would be no exception. He couldn't even raise the agonizing subject with his mammy, not after her fervently remorseful apologies for telling him about it in the first place. After all these years, George wondered what his mammy really felt about the whole excruciating thing, for by now, as far as he could see, she and the massa acted as if they were no longer aware that the other existed, at least in that way. It shamed George even to think about his mammy having been with the Massa as Charity, and more recently Beulah would be with him on those nights when he slipped away from the plantation.
But then, seeping up from the recesses of his memory, came the recollection of a night long ago when he was three or four years old and awakened one night, feeling that the bed was moving, then lying still and terrified with his eyes staring wide in the darkness, listening to the rustle of the corn shucks and the grunting of the man who lay there beside him jerking up and down on top of his mammy. He had lain there in horror until the man got up, heard the dull plink of a coin on the tabletop, the sound of footfalls, the slam of the cabin door. For a seemingly interminable time, George had fought back scalding tears, keeping his eyes tightly closed, as if to shut out what he had heard and seen. But it would always come back like a wave of nausea whenever he happened to notice on a shelf in his mother's cabin a glass jar containing maybe an inch of coins. As time passed, the depth of coins increased, until finally he no longer could bring himself to look directly at the jar. Then, when he was around ten years old, he noticed one day that the jar was no longer there. His mammy had never suspected that he knew anything about it, and he vowed that she never would. Though he was too proud ever to mention it, George had once considered talking to Charity about his white father. He thought she might understand. The opposite of Beulah, who was as black as charcoal, Charity was a considerably lighter biracial person than George. In fact, she had the tan skin that very black people like to call high yaller. Not only did Charity seem to harbor no distress whatever about her color, she had laughingly volunteered to George that her pappy was the white overseer on a big South Carolina rice and indigo plantation with over a hundred slaves where she had been born and reared until at 18 she was sold at auction and bought by Massa Teague to be their big housemaid. On the subject of skin color, about all that Charity had ever expressed any concern about was that in South Carolina, she had left behind her mammy and a younger brother who was practically white. She said that black-skinned youngins had unmercifully teased him until their mammy told him to yell back at his tormentors, turkey buzzard laid me, hot sun hatched me, god gimme this color that ain't none of yo black <laughs> business. From that time on, Charity said, her brother had been let alone. But the problem of George's own color, and how he got it, was eclipsed for the moment by his frustration at realizing that the near uprising in faraway Charleston was surely going to delay his following through, with an idea he had been developing carefully in his head for a long time. In fact, nearly two years had gone into his finally reaching a decision to try it out on Uncle Mingo. But there was no sense in telling him about it now, since the whole thing would hang on whether or not Massalia would approve of the idea, and he knew Massalia was going to remain angrily unapproachable about anything for quite a while. Though the Massa stopped carrying the shotgun after a week or so, he would inspect the game fowl only briefly every day, and after terse instructions to Uncle Mingo, would ride off as grim-faced as he had come. George didn't really realize the full gravity of what had almost happened in Charleston until, after another two weeks, despite Uncle Mingo's warning, he found himself unable to resist any longer the temptation to slip out for a visit with one of his girlfriends. Impulsively, he decided to favor Charity this time, swayed by memories of what a tigress she always was with him. After waiting to hear Uncle Mingo snoring, he went loping for nearly an hour across the fields until he reached the concealing pecan grove from which he always whistled his whip-or-will call to her. When he'd whistled four times without seeing the familiar come-ahead signal of a lighted candle waved briefly in Charity's window, he began to worry. Just when he was about to leave his hiding place and sneak on in anyway, he saw movement in the trees ahead of him. It was Charity. George rushed forward to embrace her, but she permitted him only the briefest hug and kiss before pushing him away. "'What's the matter, baby?' he demanded, so aroused by her musky body aroma that he hardly heard the quavering in her voice. "'You the biggest fool slippin' round now. Many <laughs> as gettin' shot by patrollers.' "'Well, let's get it on in your cabin, then,' said George, throwing an arm around her waist, but she moved away again. You act like you ain't even heard about no uprising. I know was one, that's all. I tell you about it then. 
and Charity said she overheard her massa and missus saying that the ringleader, a Bible-reading free black Charleston carpenter named Denmark Vesey, had spent years in planning before confiding in four close friends who helped him to recruit and organize hundreds of the city's free and slave blacks. Four heavily armed groups of them had only awaited the signal to seize arsenals and other key buildings, while others would burn all they could of the city and kill every white they saw. Even a horse company of black drivers would go dashing wildly about in drays, carts, and wagons to confuse and obstruct white people from assembling. But that Sunday morning, some scared <laughs> told his massa what's supposed to happen at midnight. Then white men's was all over, catching, beating, and torturing. <laughs> to tell who was the uprisers. Days done hung over 30 of them by now, and everywhere days throw into fear of God into <laughs> just like days doing round here now, but especially in South Kalini, done run out Charleston's free <laughs> and burnt day houses, the <laughs> preachers too, and locked up day churches claiming that stood of preaching, days been teaching <laughs> to read and write. George had renewed his efforts to start her moving toward the cabin. Ain't you been listening to me, she said, highly agitated. You get home foe, you seed and shot by some of these patrollers. George protested that inside her cabin was safety from any patrollers, as well as relief of his passion for her, which had caused him to risk being shot already. Done told you, nah. Exasperated, George finally shoved her roughly backward. Well, go on, then, and bitterly he went loping back the way he had come, wishing furiously that he had gone to Beulah's instead, because it was too late to go there now. In the morning, George said to Mingo, went up to see my mammies last night, and Miss Melizzi was telling me what she'd been hearing Massa telling Mrs. about that uprising. Unsure if Mingo would believe that story, he went on anyway, telling what Charity had said, and the old man listened intently. Finishing, George asked, How come hereabouts getting shot at about something in clear in South Kalini, Uncle Mingo? Uncle Mingo thought a while before he said, All white folks scared us. Sometime gonna organize and rise up together, he snorted derisively. But ain't gonna never do nothing together, he reflected for another moment. But this here shooting and killing you talk about gonna ease up like it always do. Soon as day's kilt and skirt. <laughs> Enough. And soon as day makes whole passel of new laws. And soon as day gets sick of paying whole bunch of peckerwood patrollers. How long all that take? asked George, realizing as soon as he had said it what a foolish question it was. And Uncle Mingo's quick look at him affirmed the opinion. Well, I show sure ain't got no answer to that. George fell silent, deciding not to tell Uncle Mingo his idea until things had returned to normal with Massalia. In the course of the next couple of months, Massalia gradually did begin to act more or less like his old self, surly most of the time, but not dangerous. And one day, soon after, George decided that the time was right. Uncle Mingo, I've been studying a long time on something, he began. I believes I got an idea might help Massa's birds win more fights than they does. Mango looked as if some special form of insanity had struck his strapping 17-year-old assistant, who continued talking. I've been five years going to the big chicken fights with y'all. Reckon two seasons back, I commenced noticing something I've been watching real close ever since. Seem like every different game cocker Massa's set of birds got their own fighting style. Scuffing the toe of one brogan against the other, George avoided looking at the man who had been training game fowl since long before he was born. We trains Massa's birds to be real strong, would reel a long wind, to win a lot day fights, just by outlasting the other birds. But I done kept account. The most times we loses is when some bird flies up over Massa's bird and gaffs him from the top, ginly in the head. Uncle Mingo, I believes if in Massa's birds got stronger wings, like I believes we could give them with whole lot of special wing exercise, I believe they'd ginly fly higher in other birds and kill even mode than they does now.
Beneath his wrinkled brow, Mingo's deep-set eyes searched the grass between George's and his own shoes. It was a while before he spoke. I sees what you means. I believes you needs to tell Massa. If you feel so, can't you tell him? Nah, you thunk it up. Massa hear it from you, good as me. George felt an immense sense of relief that at least Uncle Minko didn't laugh at the idea. But lying awake on his narrow corn shuck mattress that night, George felt uneasy and afraid about telling Massa Leah. Bracing himself on Monday morning when the Massa appeared, George took a deep breath and repeated almost calmly what he had said to Uncle Mingo, and he added more detail about different game flock's characteristic fighting styles. And when you notices Massa, them birds o' Massa Grahams fights in a fast, feisty way, but Massa McGregor's birds fights real cautious and wary like, or Cap'n Peabody strikes with they feet and spurs close together, but Massa Hoades scissors with they legs pretty wide apart. That rich Massa Jewett's birds, they ginly fights low in the air, and they pecks hard when they's on the ground, and any bird they catches a good beak hold are just liable to get gaffed right there. Avoiding the Massa's face, George missed his intensely attentive expression. Reckon what I's trying to say, Massa. If you grease with me and Uncle Mingo giving your birds some whole lots of strong wing exercise and that we ought to be able to figure out, Seem like that help him to fly up higher in the rest to gaff him from atop, and speck nobody wouldn't quick catch on. Massa was staring at George as if he had never seen him before. In the months that remained before the next cockfighting season, Massa spent more time than ever before in the game fowl training area, observing and sometimes even joining Uncle Mingo and George as they tossed gamecocks higher and higher into the air descending with a frantic flapping of their wings, trying to support their five to six pound weights, their wings grew steadily stronger. As George had prophesied, the 1823 cockfighting season opened and progressed through one after another main contest, with no one seeming to detect how or why the Leah birds were managing to win an even higher percentage of their fights than the year before. Their steel gaffs had sunk fatally into 39 of their 52 opponents by the end of the season. One morning, about a week later, Massalia arrived, in high spirits, to check on the recovery of the half-dozen of his prime birds that had been injured seriously during the season. "'Don't believe this one gonna pull through, Massa,' said Uncle Mingo, indicating one so drooping and battered that Massalia's head quickly shook in agreement." But I spec these and these next two cages gonna heal up so good, you be fighting them again next season. Mingo gestured next at the last three convalescing birds. These here ain't gonna never be perfect enough for the big main fights no more, but we can use them as catchcocks if you wants to, Massa, or they be good cull birds anyhow. Massa Leah expressed his satisfaction with the prognosis and had started toward his horse when, turning, he spoke casually to George. These nights you slip out of here tomcatting. You'd better be mighty careful about that bad. <laughs> That's sweet on the same gal. George was so dumbfounded it took a full second before anger flared within him at Uncle Mingo's obvious treachery. But then he saw that Uncle Mingo's face was no less astounded. As the massa continued, Mrs. Teague told my wife at their quilting club meeting she couldn't figure out what had come over her high y'all or housemaid until lately some of the other <laughs> told her the gals wore out from two timing you and some bad buck older. <laughs> Massalia chuckled, reckon the two of y'all sure must be tearing up that gal. Charity, two timing. As George recalled furiously with what insistence she had blocked him from her cabin that night, he forced himself to smile and laugh nervously. Uncle Mingo joined in just as hollowly. George felt stricken. Now that the Massa had discovered that he had been slipping off nights, what was he going to do to him? Having paused to let George expect his anger, Massalia said instead, in an incredible, almost man-to-man -man way, Hell, Long as you do your work, go on and chase you some tail. Just don't let some buck slice you to pieces. And don't get caught out on that road where the patrol is shooting people's... <coughs> Nasa, show ain't. George was so confused he didn't know what to say. Show appreciates, Massa. 
Masalia climbed on his horse, a discernible shaking of his shoulders, suggesting to his gamecock trainers that he was laughing to himself as he cantered on up the road. Finally alone in his shack that night, after enduring Uncle Mingo's frostiness through the rest of the day, free at last to vent his outrage at charity, George cursed her and vowed that he would turn his attentions, which she obviously didn't deserve, to the surely more faithful, if less hotly passionate, Beulah. He also remembered that tall, cinnamon-colored girl who had given him the eye at a secret frolic he had stumbled on in the woods while hurrying homeward one night. The only reason he hadn't tried her then and there was he got so drunk on the white lightning she offered him that he was barely able to stagger home by dawn, but he remembered she said her name was Ophelia and that she belonged to the very rich Massajewit, who owned over a thousand game fowl, or so it was said and whose family had huge plantations in Georgia and South Carolina, as well as the one there in Caswell County. It was a long way to walk, but first chance he got, George decided he was going to get better acquainted with that tasty-looking field girl Massajewit probably didn't even know he owned. 